The following is a teaching by Thamo Naidu. Thamo provides oversight to the Gate Global Family of Churches and is the founder and senior elder of Gate Ministry Santon, Gauteng, South Africa. His ministry calls the church to return to accurate biblical patterns and to raise up the sons of God to represent Christ in the earth. All right, let's get to the word. We've now moved to that place in the teaching where uh, I'm trying to bring a fundamental hermeneutical principle to us that everything in heaven must happen on the earth. Everything that is unseen must, man must manifest through the systems and structures that God has established in the earth. That the corporeal principle is that God always works in and through the agency called man. In our present context, the new age that we live in, which is the age of divine grace, God works through his son, his corporate son. And those are very generalized, very ambiguous statements, but when they are unpacked, you realize that God builds the systems through which he reveals himself. One of the ways that God really works in the church is through the establishment of families headed by fathers. And this principle, this principle can uh, outwork itself on various tiers. It's a very composite principle uh, that, that will be true to the microcosm of any matter uh, that is designed by God and it can also operate on the macro levels uh, of that culture. So when we talk about spiritual fathering today, I am going to remove all reservation in some of the things I'm going to tell you. I'm so convinced by it now that I'm prepared to get crucified for saying the things I have to say. Uh, one of the reasons why the earth is cursed is because we've not understood the absolute significance of the principle of fathering in the body of Christ. And while God is our, our father, he is the father, he is the principal father, he is the cardinal father, and there's no substitute to who he is, God chooses to express himself through that principle in the human race. If we, the people of God, do not know how to embrace the spirit of father represented in human vessels, then we could rob ourselves of tremendous blessings. In fact, I'm beginning to understand more and more now that it is fathers who endow their children, both in the natural and in the spiritual, with blessings that make rich and add no sorrow. The greatest inheritance a father can leave to his child is not just material inheritances. An insurance policy is good. If, if a, a father dies in the natural and he leaves his spouse and his children with a policy that could help sustain them financially in the earth, that will be good. But let me tell you, if a father can impart his spirit, which I will talk about today, to the children, to the family, and in the context of the spiritual realm, if fathers like myself can leave deposits with you, you will never be poor in life. You will always be rich. You know, one of the ways God introduces himself to the nation of Israel, he never comes to them and says to them, I am the God, Yah, you know, I'm the, the only God or the reverential God. And I'm, I mean, there are references to all of that in the scriptures. But when he comes to his people, he says, I am the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And, and, and he refers to them, even though those fathers were deceased, they were all buried in the cave called Machpelah with, the, with their wives, yet he would refer to them as if they were still living. He refers to them in a present uh, grammatical context as if they are still present amongst them. 
And yes, they were in the cloud of glory, but he saw them as very critical to the things he wants to bless them. And he, when he speaks about, I am the God of your fathers, he's speaking about how he shook hands. He had covenantal agreements, very powerful arrangements between, between those fathers. And those arrangements will determine the success of, of, and the well-being of their children uh, and their children. And sometimes he would refer to it as the third and fourth generations which is not speaking about literally that your chronology of blessings will, will end by the fourth generation. He uses it to speak about a perpetual blessing that will come upon the family of God. Sadly, sadly, and I say this after 40 years, now being the 40th year in ministry, sadly, the church substitute, substituted fathers uh, by replacing them um, with pastors. Now there's nothing wrong with being a pastor because that's a gift in the body of Christ. It's a ministry, it's an office, it's a, it's a great shepherding a privilege to direct the souls of people, but God never intended for the church to be led by fathers, uh, by pastors. God intended for the church to be led by fathers. It will, and fathers in the New Covenant, uh, in the New Ch Testament church, are called elders. These are, the, and an elder was a father, was a nobleman, he was not a novice, he was a, a good example of somebody who could domestically lead his family to the place where he qualified to lead his, uh, lead the family of God, the household of God. And these individuals we're supposed to bring a, a kind of a wholesome grace to the church. And while in a father could be a pastor, but the pastoral grace was not the predominant grace, the fathering grace is what God wanted to bring upon the church. And you do know that one of the descriptions of the church, especially in, in the uh, 27 books of the New Testament, and Jesus would talk about the Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees uh, and the scribes and the priest um, trying to take advantage uh, of widows or women that were absent, uh, who, who, where there was an absence of fathers. Basically, the principle is, and the language is very met metaphoric, he's not talking about uh, single-headed or, or mother-headed households. He's not talking about that. What he was saying was, the, because there was an absence of fathering in the church of Moses, the leadership structures of the, those churches violated the households of God. Uh, that's why the book of Malachi, chapter three, is so important. Chapter four is so important when God concludes the Old Testament uh, literature, uh, the books of the Old Testament, by saying, "And I will send you the Spirit." of the prophet Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers back to the sons, the hearts of the sons back to the fathers, lest I smite the earth with a curse. The point is that God wants to fix serious problems in the earth, and the earth will re be reduced to redundancy, to invalidity, it will become futile and empty in its purposes if the spirit of, and the grace of fathering does not come back to the house. So, so I want to make sure that at least in this house and the houses that follow the teachings from Yim, that people understand that this can't be a loose arrangement that the family of God is headed by spiritual fathers, whom we can call elders. That, and those fathers must become a mirror image of the heavenly father. They must bring not so much just the principle of fathering to households, but with it to bring the grace of fathering. Because whatever we do is we build by shouts of grace, grace to the capstone. This is a Zechariah principle that it's, uh, Clive beautifully quoted the scripture or prayed the scripture, it's not my might, no by power, but by your spirit. And um, and, and uh, the way God builds is through deposits of grace. 
that comes from the lips that have been anointed with coals of fire that can drip with grace. And I'd like to think that, that people like myself bring grace to you, not clever preaching. We bring grace. And if, you, if we here as a people know how to connect to the Spirit of Father, not loosely but genuinely, covenantally, by, by making decisive decisions that if I'm belonging to a local congregation, I'm being connected to the Spirit of a Father, and he becomes the conduit or he relays the grace of the Heavenly Father into the house. And I can tell you, great prosperity will come to houses. Um, tremendous, tremendous blessings. And you will never live in a land of famine because the true characteristic of the Heavenly Father is that where He is, there's always food. There's always bread. Uh, there's, no, there's, there's no absence of these things. Because the Father of Heaven, when He created uh, the garden, when he created the earth and put a garden in it called Eden, the interface between heaven and earth, he made sure that his son who lived in that environment will have every blessing. That's why the word Eden can often be translated as a place of super abundance. It is an overflow of divine blessings. God never created man to be a beggar. God never created us to have lack. Lack came because we've not known how to connect to the representation of our Father uh, through the mediums in which uh, we operate. So I want us here today to develop this culture, this culture of understanding how important it is that if you come to a house like this, that you see, you see yourself as belonging not to GMS, Gate Ministry Center, but you see yourself as belonging to a family. And that family is headed by a father. And if there's a father in the house, then that's not a widow's house. It's not a house without covering. And it's not an orphanage. If the, uh, and if you see that, then you know that even if you're a single mother, even though you may have been widowed, you may not have, some of us may not have parents in the natural, but if you understand this principle, you are not a widow, you are not an orphan, you are not without a husband or without a father, you will be covered, you will be blessed. Are you hearing me today? This is critical, this is critical to understanding the importance of it. You know. When you go back to Malachi, let's go to Malachi. I want you to see something, yeah? I want you to see something and I want to build a principle into our lives. Malachi chapter 4. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. This is language, it's imagery, but you know a root refers to a father, and a branch refers to a son. So God will leave you with no genealogy, no, no lineage, no sense of identity. Because identity is defined by your father. Uh, fathers in scripture give identity to sons. Uh, this, is a, this is a very important principle. But if we choose to live outside of the environment of this, because if you went to chapter 1, God, let, let's read chapter 1, just, just to get the context. And we'll get back to chapter 4. If you read chapter 1, Verse 2, I've loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? And then later on, it says, it says, let me just get to it, verse 6, a son honors his father, and a servant is master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? 
So, so the principle is that God is our Father, but He expresses it through the leadership structures of the day in which He lived. Uh, they lived, and the church there did not, in that context, appreciate the things that that God ex expected of them to re represent. That's when we get to chapter four. Now, the conclusion of this, um, and it says here. It says, that will leave them neither root nor branch. But to you who fear my name, remember in Malachi chapter 4, he's telling us who he is. He says, uh, I'm your father. Where's my honor? That's what he's saying. So if you learn how to consecrate, immortalize the name of God in your mind and in your heart, in your heart, in your mind, you, you inform your consciousness that I want to cherish God as my Father. And, but He will come to me through a medium. He will come through me through an agency. You know, it's easy to... to, to you know, I tell the story. I did an ordination on Saturday uh, to commission somebody into the ministry in, in Kenya. And I used the story about the two donkeys. Because the two donkeys is a picture of a father and a son donkey. And it's a picture of, Mal uh, of, of, of Genesis chapter 49, where God describes Judah as two donkeys connected to the vine. And when they are commissioned, they will carry Christ into the earth. And uh, the picture I left with uh, the commissioning service yesterday was, just imagine these two donkeys, a father's a donkey and a son donkey, tied to a door now in Matthew 21, which is a picture of how you access grace by being connected to a house, a family. And these two donkeys then get covered with the clothing of the 12 apostles. They take their, they take their coats and they place it over the two donkeys. And then Jesus sits sideways on the two donkeys, sideways on the two donkeys. And, um, and they carry him into the city being received with red carpet treatment, with hosannas and with, you know, it was a Feast of Tabernacles, so uh, branches of, of the uh, palm trees were, uh, were laid on the floor, on the, on, 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 on the road, so that Jesus could get VIP treatment in coming in. But just imagine the two donkeys, the baby donkey speaking to the father donkey, and saying, hey, Dad, check how these people are singing hosanna to us. Dad, they are saying that we deserve the highest praise, and so forth. And the father, with a little bit more experience, probably said to the, to the son's son, we are two unclean animals. The only reason we are made clean is because there's 12 mantles placed over us. And son, they're not giving us VIP treatment. They're actually, they're actually celebrating the one that we carry into the city. They're singing to him, but when they say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they can't receive him without receiving us. Are you understanding? So that's the principle. That's the principle. The principle is a donkey like me, a mere unclean, I mean, just another human vehicle, so, so fraught with so many deficiencies. And yet God could mantle me so I can carry Christ into a city. And when the songs of praise and adulation come and all the special treatment you get, I mean, and I get all the treatment when I travel, um, I have to keep reminding myself, I'm a donkey. You don't call me donkey, but I'm a donkey. <laughs> you have to say, blessed is he who comes in what? The name. What name? Some of us thought it was just apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. What about the name father, son, spirit? And when you receive the one who comes in the name, if you receive me who comes in the name of my father, a vicarious you know, representation, a proxy of the one who comes. 
What are you receiving? Not Tamo. You're receiving the Lord in me, the Father in me. Are you understanding that? And what did Jesus say? If you gave even a little bit of water to such a, such a one who comes in the name, you will get a reward. And if you know how to receive the person without prejudice, without uh, reservation, and if you know how to honor that one, who comes in the name of the Lord. And the honor, remember I told you, is a valuation system. It helps you to appraise and, and weigh and, and measure what level of Christ you're receiving in somebody. And you reciprocate accordingly. What happens to you? The blessings of God comes upon you and he will give you blessings that make rich and add no sorrow. Now these are things in a very sophisticated and individualistic world, very difficult to understand. Uh, that's why the Bible says here, yeah, the son of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go, look at the words, uh, and you shall go out and grow fat, grow out. So the son of righteousness will come now. And a healing here is not to heal you of your diabetes, or whatever your condition is. It may include that, but it's more than that. It'll, the, the word healing here has got to do with bring you, bring, bringing you back to your wholesome self, bringing you back to a place of how God has designed you to function, because it's speaking about righteousness as in compliance to a heavenly design. When you come back, you are restored, reconstituted to a to the to way you should function, and then you will you will grow fat like staff, uh, stall fed calves, which is speaking about the baby cow, the son or the child cow. In other words, when this dimension comes upon you, tremendous blessings comes upon the church, blessings that we don't even understand. You know, I tell you, there's so much of secrets in God's word. And I don't know why in some circles, not here, but in some circles people are so stubborn. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded him in Arab for all Israel with the statutes and judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Now, now you know, we can't read the, the, the Bible just by, by concluding that book and thinking that's it. God in his wisdom has set out that the Bible will continue with the following words in, in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy, the family line, the lineage of Jesus Christ. See how God concludes the Bible in the Old Covenant and then introduces it to us by showing us how important it is to understand the principle of family that God was not gonna first introduce us to Jesus by saying, oh, that's my son. But God's gonna first introduce us to a line that will help us to understand the unbroken succession that will set the stage for the fullness of God to come into the earth, born of a woman, uh, so that we could enjoy the blessings. Even Jesus, the incarnate one, the eternal Logos, had to prove that he belonged to a family. Can you see it? None of us fell out of heaven. All of us come into the earth through a womb. While the woman came out of the man, every man came out of the woman thereafter. And the principle is that unless you're born of a woman, then the head of the serpent cannot be bruised. So that the seed that was the, ch the Christ seed will bruise the head of the serpent, will destroy the head of the serpent. 
So the family line is so important. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac begot Jacob. And some of your Bibles will say, Abraham fathered Isaac. Isaac fathered Jacob. Jacob fathered Judah and his brothers. Judah fathered Perez. And if you go down the line, verse 17, so all the generations, all the family lines from Abraham to David are 14 generations. God counts it. This is boring things to read, but for God it's so important to put it in the book. From David until the captivity in Babylon are 14 generations. And from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Now 3 times 14 gives you 42. We all know this. Jesus is number 41 on this list. If you can count it. Um, Joseph is number 40. Joseph had to have a father. And remember, Jesus, Joseph was not... The, the, the biological father of Jesus. Um, he didn't, it was not Joseph's seed that gave, that gave, that caused Jesus to be conceived in the womb, the Logos. No, it was God's seed, but God still placed a father, a stepfather over Jesus. Then you get chapter 18. So the, the 42nd generation is the chosen generation. A seed shall be accounted as one generation, Psalm 22 says. That's you and me. We are the endless generation. We are the last generation. We are the six times seven. Six, the man, seven, perfection. Six times seven, the perfect man, 42nd generation. We are the 42nd generation in God, in God. So God has chosen us to be and, and we are defined, according to 1 Peter 2, 9, as a generation that we must have a genealogy. And God, in his wisdom and counsel, has very powerfully, architecturally designed for the church to function as families in the earth. That's so why it takes each one of you, according to Psalm 68, verse 6 and 7, and he puts his only son in families. I mean, it doesn't make sense. Only son, solitary son, in families. How can you take one and put him in many families? By placing each one of us, even though he sees us as one son, one body, the body of Christ, uh, one son, we sit with him in the same seat, yet we are a many-membered body, and he places us in families. So when you start looking, when you start looking for a church, don't look for music, don't look for anything. Look, can I belong to that family? Do I have a father where I know that if I stay connected to him, to a root, I'll be a good branch. I'll be a well-fed calf. Uh, I will not lack. I will not be under a curse. I will not be part of a widow's house. I will always be part of a household that brings glory to God. Are you hearing me? That's thereafter, in verse 18, we get the birth of Jesus. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. In other words, God will take 17 verses to first set a family line and then tell us how Jesus will be born. God could have started by telling us about the birth of Jesus in verse 1 because that's the centerpiece, him coming into the world. But God was not interested in the centerpiece until he gave us the fundamentals that give rise to what is the absolute centrality, which is that Christ will be born. But God had to first make sure everyone understood the principle of lineage, the principle of lineage. In fact, if you went to Romans chapter, uh, chapter 1, it, you know, people like the Apostle Paul understood this principle. Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, bond servant, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, 
which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning, verse 3, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born and seen our lineage of the seed of David. And we know he was not born of the seed of David, but that's his, God connects him to David. He was born of that lineage of David according to the flesh that even the eternal Lord had to be identified with a family. And who are we then to say that I don't need to belong to a family? Or I don't need to have a father in my life in the Lord. We have no right to do that. If, if, and Joseph's name was included in Matthew chapter 1. And the fellow was not Jesus' father. I mean, forgive me for saying fellow, but you understand what I'm trying to highlight here? Uh, and, and God put his name in the record, uh, supposedly the father of Jesus. And from there on, God never spoke to Mary after Joseph said, okay, I won't put her away. Okay, I won't divorce her. I'll, I'll marry her. Okay, when he said that, then God from that day onwards only spoke to to Joseph concerning the welfare of that family in terms of uh, uh, going to Egypt and so forth. God spoke to, e to Mo Joseph. When, when Joseph had to leave Egypt with Mary and Jesus to come back to Nazareth, um, um, God spoke to Joseph and said, Pharaoh, the, 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 uh, Herod has died. Now you can take the boy back. There's protocol with God. That's why while God can speak to every one of you, every one of you can have a conversation with God. But when it comes to corporate family matters, God will stand at the door and knock until the head of the house opens the door. Principle. Principle. God can talk to you personally, but he will not give you directions personally. He will always give it to the one who leads that family or lead that group of people. These are fundamental protocols that the church in an isolated and independent world that is governed by the spirit of this age, the spirit of existentialism, doesn't understand. In the world that we live in, it's about I, me, and myself. Uh, I don't need anybody, I got the Holy Spirit. Uh, not realizing the, pro the protocols of God's word. And it says here, Verse 4 of chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, and so forth. Paul is drawing a fundamental principle by highlighting how important it is to be part of a family. Did you know that to be, part, to be uh, an integral part, to be an integral part of the building processes of God. Building processes of God. You had to prove your lineage. If you could not prove your lineage, you couldn't be part of God's building processes. Let me read something for you. Go to Ezra chapter 2. I mean, if you read all these these chapters, like chapter 2, you will just see list and list of family lines. List and list, meticulously detailed. We joke often in this church that if you tell me you read the Bible, I can guarantee you that some of you never read every line when it came to genealogy. Okay, you skipped it because your grandfather's name is not here. Okay, and so... It's not your photo album that you want to look at. But God will highlight how he builds by knitting together the principle of family. But when it came to verse 59, and these were the ones who came up from Tel Malah, uh, Ezra 2.59. I'm reading from the New King James. Tel Malah. Tel Hasha, Cherub, Adon, and Emma, but they could not, they could not identify their father's house. They could not identify their father's house 
all their genealogy, whether they were of Israel, the sons of Delilah, Deliah, the sons of Tobiah, and this is the guy that was, 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 was controlling the treasury, and the sons of Nakoda, 652, and of the sons of the priests, the sons of Habiah, the sons of Koz, and the sons of Basilia, who took a wife of the daughters of Basilia, and Gilead, and was called by their name. These sought their listing amongst those who were registered by ge genealogy, but they were not found. Therefore, therefore, they were excluded from the priesthood as defiled, as defiled. You know, people can disqualify, in the old covenant, if you couldn't prove your identity, if you couldn't point to which family you belonged to, uh, you were considered alien, foreign to the purposes of God. It was, in, in, it was a requisite that everyone had a lineage. And this is more than having an identity document. Uh, you had to know the house you belonged to. You know, 1 Samuel chapter 17 is a beautiful scripture. Let me read it for you. Chapter 17. You've heard me refer to this in the past. Um, verse 55. Verse 55. This is the story of David conquering Goliath. And it gives us a history of David's relationship with King Saul. And eventually, David carrying, carrying cheese and bread to his brothers. Uh, three of his brothers were under the leadership of King Saul. They followed Saul, so they went to fight for Saul. And David heard about the intimidating uh, remarks of Goliath and how he taunted, psychologically traumatized the nation of Israel. And, and David very boldly, even though he was rebuked repeatedly by his brothers, said, I can go and kill this guy for you guys. I mean, it was, it was arrogance at the highest level. The boy was not even 20 years old. He didn't qualify to go to war. He, he, he didn't fulfill the requirements of, the, of military conscription. Yet, David says, I can kill this guy. And I have a good CV. I took out the lion, I took out the bear. Nobody could touch my father's sheep. And this guy is mocking a covenantal people. I'll take him out. And it's a, it's a full story, but I don't want to get into the story here. David conquers Goliath. He has tremendous success. Uh, verse 57, then as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, said to him, to Abner, whose son, I mean to David, whose son are you, young man? If you went and read, this, read the story, Saul knew whose son he was because whenever he wanted David to play the harp, whenever he wanted to, David to play the harp, he would call the young man by getting permission from the father, Jesse. But that day, after he conquered Goliath, he said, he asked the question, whose son are you, young man? The principle is that I don't want to know how successful you are. I want to know the source of your success. I want to know the root that produced such a powerful branch. I want to know, uh, I need to know your father because you couldn't become this unless you belong to a certain lineage. Can you see the principle? I mean, this principle is highlighted in, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, because some of us, we, you know, the, the church, I don't know about you, but the church I come out of, which is the charismatic new Pentecostal church, uh, we celebrate gifts. We celebrate uh, the giftedness of people. 
Uh, people leave one church to go to another church because the church does not recognize their gifts. And so we keep hopping like, like, like gypsies from one caravan to another caravan, from one place to another place. Um, because we think it's all got to do with recognition of one's gift. But uh, in, in 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 10 onwards, um, we get the story of King Saul. King Saul. And uh, let me read it for you. When they came there to the hill, this is King Saul before he became, before he was commissioned as a king, to the hill, there was a group of prophets to meet him. Then the Spirit of God came upon him and he prophesied amongst them. So yes, Saul prophesying. He, he was clueless about prophecies. The moment he connected to a very powerful environment of prophets, he became a prophet. And it happened that when all who knew him formally saw that he indeed prophesied amongst the prophets, that the people said to one another, what is this that has come upon the son of Kish? The son of Kish. See how they, they, they referred to him, not as Saul. What is this that has come upon Saul? But what is this that has come upon the son of his father, Kish? Then a man from there answered and said, but who is their father? Let's not worry about Saul prophesying. If he joins such a powerful company, let's see whether the source that produced the prophetic is authentic or not. Because you can be accurate in your gift, but if you come from an inaccurate location, we cannot celebrate your gift. We need to know the authenticity of the source that produces the gift. Are you understanding this? And, and this has got to do with character, with integrity. It's got to do with virtue. It's got to do with the culture of learning how to live a life that produces the kind of people that we want. You know, J Paul, uh, James will say this. He would say, can bitter and sweet waters come out of the same fountain? And if you understand the principle of fountain or the principle of a well, then you have to understand the principle of patriarchy. Uh, uh, if you went to, I think it's John chapter 4, um, when Jesus encountered the woman at the well of Jacob, that place was called Sokar. And it was, Sokar means the place of drunkenness. So there was a patriarchal well in a place where people used to normally get drunk. Instead of drinking from the well, you got drunk by the contamination of a principle or a representation of what God wanted in that environment. And that place, that place also became the place of Samar Samaritans, where it was a hybrid of half Jew and Gentile, which means a compromised gospel. It was a, it was a toxic environment. And this woman who was looking for spiritual covering, I mean, marriage here was, she, she had given up on the institution of marriage. She tried it so many times, it didn't work. She was now shacking with a man. And that's the principle of spiritual covering. This is a picture of a church, half Jew, half Gentile, living in an environment of intoxication when there's a pure well there. And it is in that context Jesus speaks about the principle of worshiping God in spirit and truth. And she found a man who could cover her and make her complete in areas that she was incomplete. Are you understanding? Source is very important. It's not so much how good you, you are prophesying. I was, I was flying back and I had the privilege of listening to an interview on TV. I was, you know, Sean was asked to, to fill in for us because I had to get back on, on a TV program and, um, and he spoke on the power of the prophetic. He spoke on the power of the prophetic well, that, that was the interview on national TV last night. And I was so touched by one of the statements he made. He said, you cannot celebrate. He was trying, Sean's a powerful prophet. We, we all know that. Powerful. He's genuine. He's the real deal. And uh, his gift is powerful. Um, but he said this. He said, you cannot celebrate the gift or the office of a prophet unless the prophet can tell you 
that is connected to a legitimate apostolic father that can guide him and hold him accountable to the things he says. Are you understanding the power of accountability? The power of saying that if I want to operate in this, I can't do it as a lone ranger. I, all ministries have to be in submission. No ministry, according to the call of bishops and overseeing bishops in the Bible, should be insubordinate. In other words, anyone saying, oh, I don't need another covering, I got the Holy Spirit. You have to be in submission to somebody who is a representation of God's Spirit to your life. And, and I've seen this, this lawlessness, this, this emptiness that's taking place in the Church of Jesus Christ today where people can't prove their, their registry, they cannot find themselves included in the lineages of God. They, are, they don't understand what it is to be, you know, in Christ, which is to be in a father-son relationship, both in the spirit and in the natural. And because of all of that, so many people are robbing themselves of the blessings of God. Are you hearing what I'm saying here today? Do you capture what I'm saying? The importance of not only belonging to a family, but being very accurately connected to the purposes of God. You know, one of the, the sad, one of the tragedies of the, of the apostolic, uh, the disciples that followed Jesus, is the story of Judas, of Judas and how Matthias would come to replace him. And, um, and you know the story that God, Judas was, uh, let's read it, read in Acts chapter one. And in those days, verse 15, Acts 1, 15, and in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Um, altogether, the number of names was about 120 and said, men and brethren, this scripture has to be fulfilled, um, which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus, for he was numbered with us and obtained a part in the ministry. Yes, Peter, the first amongst the 12, saying to all of the people around him, there is order to God. We have to follow scriptural design. We have to know the mandates of God. And he says one of it is that even though Judas violated his place, he robbed himself of his part in the ministry. We can't just cancel him, delete him. We have to replace him. We can't vacate that position because that part is as important as the other 11 parts. And the 11 needs the other to become 12. The principle. And in numerology, you know, biblical numerology, the number 12 speaks about governance, about order, about oversight and direction and so forth. And you know what the Bible says here in brackets? In brackets, verse 18. Now this man, referring to Judas, he loses his name now. He loses that significance. This man purchased the field with the wages of iniquity the 30 pieces of silver. And falling headlong, falling headlong, he burst in the middle and all his entrails gushed out. And it became known to all those dwelling in Jerusalem uh, so that the field is called in his own language, Akal Dhamma, that is the field of blood. Here's the principle, here's the principle. One of the most graphic signs of losing your place in God, in this context, the leadership position in God, the part of a ministry, is that this man committed suicide. But I want you to see the picture of suicide here. The picture is that he hung himself on a tree. The same tree that, that Jesus died on, uh, comparatively another tree, he hangs himself. But when he hangs himself, he puts the rope at the point around his neck, which simply means that which, the head which is connected to the body, he disconnects it by hanging. He, dis he disconnects 
the principle of headship from the body and everything that was in his, in his belly, in his colon, gushes out. And this is a place that's the residency of, of truth. This is the place where you, you carry grace in your bosom, in your bosom. And, um, and the principle is, the principle is that he not only disconnected himself from a leadership position, headship, but he also lost all the grace that was upon him. And the place that he was supposed to have been blessed in became the place of wickedness, the place of blood, of desolation. How many people just do not know how to connect to the body, connect to the grace of God, and to connect to his purposes? In verse 20 it says, for it is written in the book of Psalms, Psalm 109 verse 8 that is, let his dwelling place be desolate. In other words, all those that were supposed to be a part of a Judas order will now be in a place of desolation. And you know desolate means the place of foxes, jackals, a wicked land, a land that nothing gets built in. If you try to build Malachi chapter 1, God breaks it down. You try to break through and, and then you have breakdowns. Nothing seems to succeed in this environment. And so many people rob themselves of the blessings of God. And the Bible says, let no one live in it. And then it says, let another take his office. And the word for office here is the word episcope, which is out of which we get the word uh, elder or bishop, uh, overseeing bishop, which means a father that was supposed to be an overseer of, of a certain part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. I mean, what a tragedy. What a tragedy that a man could sell his soul for, a, for 30 pieces of silver and lose such a distinguished and noble place in the body of Christ. And all of the grace of God upon him was wasted. Wasted. He lost the truth that was upon him. And so today I want to highlight the, the significance. The significance of us learning how to be part of a family Understand that those that God places over us, He places uh, them over us so that our places would not be des desolate. That's the, con the converse of the principle of Judas. And that that place of fatherlessness, of selling Christ, of vacating your eldership principle will now become a place of demonic activity. It will be destitution it will be barrenness, it will be unfruitfulness, and all of that. And none of us want to live in that environment. But if, you, if Judas didn't sell out, imagine what his place would be. It will be a place of oversight, it will be a place of impartations, of transfer of graces, of bringing fruitfulness and, and the blessings of God upon that whole environment. And these are the principles that all of us have to start to see happen amongst us here today. So, I think it's very, very important for us as a family to come to a place where we realize that connecting, and I'm not asking you to worship a man. I will never allow it to happen to me in this house or anywhere I go. I don't believe in veneration. I don't believe in manipulation. I won't allow it to happen in the eldership structures of this church. Uh, but, but, but that does not mean we don't remain connected. Uh, it, it simply means that you have to know how to be plugged in, switched on. You have to be on frequency. You have to know that your location in God is defined by being connected to a father and the father's house and that all your successes are directly linked to how God uses uh, the genealogical line to relay blessings upon you and the ultimate purpose of fathering is that you should be you should be doing two things greater or two times more than your father does are you understanding? The purpose of fathering is that you become better than your father. You may not be greater than him, 
None of us can be greater than the one that brings us into the world, but you can do greater things than the one that brought you into the world. Are you understanding? The ultimate is not to be less than. Um, uh, David, David is a good example of that. What he did, his father Jesse couldn't do, and, uh, but his father Jesse is celebrated always whenever you see the name David, the son of Jesse. Son of Jesse. So, do you think we can arm this house? you think we can arm this house to become such mighty men and women? Do you think we can arm them with the same spirit that God puts upon this house? Because why would God put you in a house if you're going to carry another spirit? Huh? Uh, what they say, the, the acorn doesn't fall far from the tree? No? Or the popo? Not the popo yet. Okay. Um, do you think we can start to operate in this dimension of existence? Listen, listen. We all should enjoy tremendous favor and grace from God. You know this, so if we're building a family by raising the sons of God, then that family will be defined by the predominant grace that flows from the head downwards and in the context of this, Christ is the head, but he has, he has representative heads like people like myself, and that anointing must flow to the hems of the garment. Okay, we all should carry the same favor, and some of us should learn how to manipulate. They say sometimes that the anointing on the head, the concentration of the anointing is the same at the hem. Powerful, the principle of equalization. Equalizer. And the exploits that some of us here should do are great because you're operating in the spirit of the Father, and that spirit allows you to live. It allows you to live meaningfully. The story in Genesis chapter 14 is a very powerful story, but it highlights again that if you stay in a certain environment, you, you enjoy the blessings of that en environment. If a mountain is continuously in the cloud, that a mountain produces a river with the cloud being the source. That a mountain, that mountain uh, and uh, while it may have its own nature, but it carries some very substantial blessings by remaining in a certain environment. The dew in that mountain produces a river through those rocks, and the rock becomes flint that will produce water and sometimes honey for all of us. It's in that context that we need to teach all of ourselves that when we do connect to a house that we're under a motto, under a banner, under a divine purpose. You know, I don't want to be judgmental here, but if I'm a failure, you all would be failures. If I'm a success, we all should be successful. If there's a predominant grace upon me, and we all are drinking from the same world, that grace should be upon you. Uh, Abraham gave Isaac wells, and even though the enemy tried to take the wells, uh, Isaac learned the principle that if my father could produce worlds, then I can produce worlds. And Isaac, even in times of famine, was extremely su successful. The Bible says that Isaac sowed in a time of famine, and he reaped a harvest. When no one else was reaping, he was reaping, because he understood covenantal blessings and divine transfers. He just understood it. The same, you know, when I studied David and those who came to the cave of Adullam, they came in debt, distressed, disillusioned, discontented. They were a mess. But because they stayed in that, 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 that cave, about a thousand of them in one cave, they all became as strong as David, if not stronger. They became mighty men. The Bible tells us, let me close with this, in Genesis chapter 14, and this is, I'll read it for you. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elazar, Chedolamer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of nations. I'm only highlighting this to show you all the kingdoms that were operating in the days of, uh, of our father Abram. And they made war at Bera, king of Sodom, Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adama, Shemember, king of 
Zehoim, and the king of Bela, that is Zohar. All these joined in the valley of Sidon, that is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Chedaloma, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In the fourteenth year, Chedaloma and the kings that were with him uh, came and attacked the Rephaim in Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Z Z Z Zuzim in Ham, the Imim in Shaver Kiriatim, and the Hor uh, Horites in the mountain of Seir, as far as Al Paran, which is by the wilderness. And they turned back and came to En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and attacked all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who dwelt in Hazen, Hazazon, Tamar. Now these guys are well like gigantic people, and yet this coalition of kings came and conquered them. And the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zebohim, and the king of Bela, that is Zo, went out and joined together in the valley of Sodom against Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, Tidal, king of nations, Amphorel, king of Shinnah, and Ariok, king of Elazar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Sodom was, uh, was full of asphalt pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell there, and the remainder of them fled to the mountains. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, all their provisions, and went their way. They also took Lot, Abraham's brother, brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom, and his goods, and departed. Here's the point I'm making. These were powerful kingdoms fighting each other, and the superpower prevailed over them. So great was this, this coalition of kings that they even conquered giants. The, the Amalekites, gigantic people, forceful people. And now Abraham is in a quandary because his nephew, his brother's son, his father's grandchild, and his family were captured. And Abraham, as a father, he realized, no matter how powerful all the kingdoms are, I have to rescue my nephew, who was like a son to me, like a son to me. Then one who escaped came and told Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt by the terebinth tree of Mamre the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Anna, and they were allies with Abraham. Now when Abraham heard that his brother, that's how he saw Lot, his brother was taken captive. He armed, he armed his 318 servants. That's all he had against a coalition of so many kings. So powerful these guys were. It was intimidating to think that you could, you could ever go with just 318 servants to conquer such a kingdom. But the Bible says he armed them. The word for armed means that which was on Abraham, he put it on the 318. This is called a divine transfer. This is a father, Abram, Abram, noble father, going to rescue a brother at the risk of losing his own life. But he understood the principle of fathering. He understood the Ab principle, that in, in the Ab principle there's protection, there's preservation, there's immunity, there's security. There is a, a kind of a hidden shield there are shields around those who are not operating the grace, the principal grace of fathering. And he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house. It tells us these guys were not hired. They came out of his house. They may not have been his biological children, but they were like a family to him. And he went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, and he and his servants attacked them and pursued as far as Hobah, which is not of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and also brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. Then the king of Sodom 
went out to meet him in the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return, uh, return from the defeat of Ch Ch Chedorlaomer and the kings who were left with him. When he armed them, when he put his spirit upon them, they conquered the enemy. Now the king of Sodom wanted to enter into a pact with him. I want to say to every one of us here today that when we get this right, when we know how to be born of the same family, the same spirit will come upon all of us. And your weaknesses will be overcome. It could be a financial problem. The strength of this house is that while we, we don't talk about money, this house is very strong in the area of faith and favor in finance. I mean, I, 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 it defies what we do. Why? Because grace. This house is not short of bread. This house, if you really know how to connect, you will not be a failure in the area of finance or, or, or steps of faith because we live off God's word. This house is very strong and holding on to God. I'd rather perish trusting God's word than try to survive by developing my own survival tool, toolkit. Are you understanding? That's how strong this house is. And, if, and, I, and, and you can be part of the house. You could still have, I mean, you could have, for example, the most powerful mobile device here. But if you don't know how to connect to your cloud or to this, to the Wi-Fi in this house, your mobile device is just another empty tool, inactive. You have to know how to connect to enjoy the successes. Some of us, we, we think connection takes place by affiliation. It doesn't happen by affiliation. It comes by covenantal connection, joinings in the spirit, becoming one, learning how to hold on. And when you, do, when you start to enjoy that kind of frequency, then there'll be success. That's why in the, in the kingdom of God, not everyone gets the same return. Some 30-fold, some 60-fold, some 100. Why? By the measure you hear. And some get nothing. So how can we be in a graceful house and not enjoy the blessings of God? The only way is because we disconnect. We disconnect. I'm not asking you to worship me, but I'm asking you to start to understand the fundamental principles of God as we worship Him in spirit and truth. Are you hearing me here today? And if we do this right, then we will be blessed. We'll be blessed. Okay, I preach for more than I should, but please stand with me. The Bible says in Numbers 2, verses 1 and 2, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, Every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own standard. Everyone say own standard. Beside the emblems of his father's house. These are fundamental principles. They shall camp some distance from the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, being connected to your father's house is first a requisite before you connect to the tabernacle, the presence of God. Are you hearing me today? Some of us, if we get the revelation of what I'm saying today, there can be a major upgrade in your life, major upgrade. If you don't get it and you're disconnected, you could rob yourselves of some of the beautiful things God wants to do in your lives. Everyone say standard, emblem. You need to know the standard and the emblem, the representations, the profile of your father's house and see the blessings that come with that. Lift your hands to the Lord. The fundamental principle of generational building, this is the generation of the, of the family of Jesus, is that generational building generates grace. When you say, I belong to a holy generation, and that generation is subdivided into families, when you know how to stay connected to your family, you generate an environment for God to prosper you, to bless you. And I'm not trying to monetize this, but your prosperity will be wholesome, wholesome. You can't be hearers anymore. You have to be doers. So lift those hands to the Lord and say, Lord, help me. Help me 
to define my steps, to define my position, to become steadfast in my belief. Help me to belong in a way that brings glory to your name. Father, I pray for all of us here. These are your loving servants, your children. You love them with an everlasting love. But help them to see the design today. Help them to see the pattern. Help them to see that their success is determined by the principle of succession. That their place within the genealogy of God will determine how grace is generated and supplied to them. So, Father, I'm asking for eyes to open, for minds to be enlightened, for hearts to receive the seed of your word, your grace. Such great people are amongst us here, Father. Such potential because of what you put in them. Help them to understand connectivity. Help them to understand the principle of how you ride into environments like the donkey and his son. Help them to understand what it is to be connected to fathers so that they can be effective in their ministries, in their callings, in their vocations. Like David had to prove his lineage to Saul. Like the priest had to prove their lineage to Ezra. Help us, Lord, never to be a people without a registry without a sense of identity. Lord, I'm asking for this house. I ask for you very, very sincerely that this house will become so rich in understanding the principle of family, the principle of being part of a patriarchy. Help this house, even not the youngest amongst us, to realize the corporate anointing, the mantle of grace that you have given to this house. So I bless this house today. I bless your people. Bless them with understanding. I bless them with divine insights. And as we worship you now, Lord, by receiving the Holy Communion, we do so with a deep sense of realizing that that table represents more than just some wine and some bread. That table represents how heaven comes to the earth and how the communion of the body is designed to function. So bless the house as they partake in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead and partake um, as we sing.